also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. Good morning. Welcome to Watkins United Methodist Church. It's uh, lovely to see everybody, and it's lovely to be in power, if you, especially for those of us that are not with it uh, this weekend. So uh, continue blessings for all those people out there trying to restore all that power, and many thanks for their hard efforts. We now invite you to stand and sing and worship with us. Lord, I find you in the seeking. Lord, I find you in the doubt. And to know you is to love you. And to know so little else I need you. Oh, how I need you oh how i need you oh how i need you lord i find you in the seeking lord i find you in the doubt and to know you is to love you and to know so little else i need you oh how i need you oh how i need you oh how i need you Lord, I seek you every day. Let my life be for your glory. Woven in your threads of grace, I need you. Oh, how I need you. Oh, how I need you. light i will go where you shine break the dawn crack the skies make the way bright before me in your light i will find all i need all i need is you light glorious light i will go where you shine break the dawn crack the skies make the way bright before me in your light I will find all I need, all I need is you. Oh, how I need 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 you. Where are you now? 
When darkness seems to win Where are you now When the world is crumbling Oh, I, I, I hear you say I hear you say, look up, child. Hey, look up, child. Hey, where are you now when all I feel is doubt? Where are you now when I can't figure it out? Oh, I, I, I hear you say, I hear you say, look up, child. Hey, look up, child. You're not threatened by the war, you're not shaken by the storm, I know you're in control. Even in our suffering, even when it can't be seen, I know you're in control. You say, I hear you say, look up, child. Hey, look up, child. Hey, look up, child. Hey, look up, child. Hey, look up. You may be seated. Well, good morning. Ooh, let me pull that a little away. Welcome to Watkins, whether you're here in the congregation with us or out there in your home. We welcome you to here today. Hope that you are enjoying the sunshine. I love the sunshine. I'm so glad to see the sunshine. Hope you are too. <laughs> uh, if you are visiting with us for the first time, please take one of these Watkins cards that are in the pew right in front of you and fill it out and let us know who you are. And if you have a special prayer request, just write it down on here and put it in the offering page or give it to one of our ushers, ushers and we'll reach out to you. Thank you again for being here today. So glad to see your faces. Please bow in prayer with me. Almighty and ever-loving God, you invite us deeper into your world, your people, your Lent. May this time be one of outward focus, seeking you in those when we often ignore. Help us live a Lent focused on freedom, generosity, and encounter. Give us hearts hungry to serve you and those who need what we have to give. Thank you again, dear Lord. Amen.
We can't see the morning light, but we can hear something, something different. Yes, something is most definitely different. The hum. Can you hear it? I put my hands to the ground to feel the earth shake below. I watch the horizon to keep my bearings. I feel the rocks shiver. Reflections in the water give way to the vibrations. Trees tremble from leaf to root. This is going to be loud. And when the dawn breaks, all the world will hear it. This note will become a symphony, a song that will soar higher than Everest. The crashing waves will sing back up and the glaciers will send it into space. This song will change everything. Generation after generation will learn it by heart. And I will sing it to my children. This song will be carried to the edge of the universe and back again. Listen, do you hear it? Its rhythm is redemption, its tempo is hope, and its melody is grace. Its words are written on our hearts, for the song is our ransom, our advocate, and our bridegroom. It's our peace, our joy, and exactly where we belong. It heals, it restores, it forgives, and it never, ever brings it up again. It costs nothing. It's more precious than anything, and it demands everything. Praise be to God, for Christ is risen today. Good morning. Okay. We got this, guys. We're going to do it one more time. Good morning. Thank you. I'm excited to be in the worship space here with you today. Um, I'd like to invite our kiddos forward uh, while I have one announcement for us. This Thursday, we will be heading to the UofL Wesley Foundation, and Kathy Hoffman is cooking a meal for the college students. And so Kathy um, has invited the youth to come out and to help her uh, prepare and to also go and serve food to the college ministries. Check out UofL and hang out with Jamela Jones, who I think we learned a few weeks ago is pretty awesome. And so that's something exciting. There will be an email tomorrow about sign up, details about when to drop off kids, pick up, transportation, and chaperones. So be looking for that tomorrow morning, and I'll have that for you. You guys ready for children's moment? Yeah, awesome. Okay, so today we don't have to sit down. Today we get to stand up and run around and be energetic. So today we're talking about ransom. Do you all know what ransom is? Me neither. It's okay. It was, it was hard to pay attention to attack during Rob's sermon earlier. But today, we're talking about Jesus and helping us live our lives freely. And so have you all ever heard of a game called Freeze Tag? <gasps> yes, it's the most exciting game in the world. Do you agree? Yes. Yeah, it's awesome. And so today, we're going to learn how Jesus comes into our life that, you know, last week we talked about the archer. Can everyone try to do a bow and arrow real quick? Make a bow and arrow. You got to hold it. You're going to pull back really hard, really strong, and then release. And so sometimes, you know, in life, when we make a mistake, when we're feeling icky inside, and we try to shoot the arrow, and Rob likes to call it missing the mark, and that's sin. And so Jesus, in the game of freeze tag, he unfreezes us. That when we get frozen, when we're, when we're caught, when we're trapped, when we, we feel that icky feeling inside of our stomach, that Jesus tags us, boop, boop, boop. And he unfreezes us. And he lets us move around the world freely, sharing peace with others, serving other people, helping others, and feeling that joy inside of our lives. Can I yeah, you can. It's okay. <laughs> and so today we're going to be playing freeze tag. My friend Elliot's going to help us out. We're going to make um, a nice little artwork from Sandra. Does that sound good to you all? Yeah, okay. So can I have everyone hold their hands together like this? And then bow your heads with me, please. Dear Lord, we thank you for this wonderful day, and thank you for being in this room. We're excited that we get to talk about freeze tag. We're excited that we get to learn more about you, Jesus Christ. 
And so today I'd like to lift up all the, the crazy thunderstorms and tornadoes that we got here today. That people are hurting today, people are grieving, but we know that you're there with them. We know that you're there comforting them and loving on them and helping them. And we thank you for that. And we ask that we learn something new, we learn something fresh today. In your name we pray. Amen. Before Ms. Julie comes up and does our offertory prayer for you, I just want to give you an update on what's going on in here. So as you were told last week by Aaron Sullivan, one of the members of our trustees, is that we have painted out there. Now we are going to continue painting into this sanctuary all before the end of this month. Isn't that exciting? I think so. I think it's going to look beautiful. A couple questions that people have asked me. Let me just put this out there. What color are you going to paint it? That's a great question, isn't it? And so what we're going to do is continue the same colors that we have out there in the lobby into the sanctuary. So as you look out there, you'll find a lot of light gray that's going around majority of the walls, and that will be all from the back to the sides up here. You'll find underneath uh, kind of an accent, a dark gray. That will be going on behind me on these three panels, and then you find the white is kind of the trim, and that will be all the trim that goes around the room. Does that sound beautiful? I think it's going to be great. Why are we doing this? I think Aaron did a fantastic job of describing the why behind it. One, it's to freshen up the space, right? To to make it more welcoming, to, to modernize it a little bit. A part of that for us to continue to push forward in our worship ministries for the next decade, two decades, three decades, right? That will help us enliven our space. You know, as I've been here and we've started to do some of these projects, I found a new energy. Have you? There's a new renowned energy at Watkins, and we want to capitalize that and continue that on. And so if you'd like to give towards that painting project, there are a couple ways that you can do that. The first is if you are here in person, you'll find envelopes in front of you. If you have cash, you can use those envelopes. And make sure you mark it painting project painting project. If you have a check, you can do the same thing, right? Memo line, painting project. If you want to give online, we have Venmo and Church Center. What do you think you make the memo line? Painting project, right? And you'll find out there as you walk into the welcome area, a a thermometer that kind of keeps you updated. Right now we're at a thousand and we want to reach our goal by the end of this month so that we can paint in less than a week. Um, the, the, The company can do that and we can have it all done by Holy Week, which is really coming up quick, right? Big goal, isn't it? big goal, but I think we can get there. So if you'd like to do that, that's the information. If you have any questions about color schemes or the why or fundraising, come talk to me. Kathy is also on trustees, and I think a couple of other of us here in the room, um, we'd love to entertain any questions you may have um, about this and the excitement that we have behind it, but I just want to give you those resources of knowing how we can continue to do that. If you're worshiping online with that, we also encourage you um, to contribute towards it if you feel led. There's a, a, on our website a, a page that says give, and we'll walk you through instructions on how to do that. We love that. Now, Julie, it's your turn to come on up here. I'm getting the hang of this thing. <laughs> okay. Good morning. I'm Julie, as um, the pastor said. So uh, different ways to give. Just talked about it. Venmo, our church website, the um, envelopes in front of you for our offertory. And God, you know, um, he gives us so much in our lives and ways to see his grace and amazing um, things that he does for our world and so um our youth pastor was talking about the storm um and driving in today i was noticing like all the trees um flowering and stuff like that and so i think god gives us moments when out of the storm in our lives or in you know actual life like you know storms actual storms and in the Lenten season, as we think about that, out of the storm comes light, right? And so, like, out of the storm, we drive down and we see all these trees blooming and stuff. So I just want to thank God for that. And then as um, these times are, um, we're coming into spring, and um, 
we're more outside and we have opportunities to give in different ways um, when we see our neighbors in need that that would be a place upon our hearts so Lord God we just thank you for today we thank you that you bring us out of the storm in our lives in actual storms and um, biblically the way that you save us your grace God we pray as we move forward in this season that as we see um, opportunity, God, that you would lead our hearts um, in those moments where you call us, where we are needed, God, that you would place that upon our hearts so that we could serve. And we thank you for your grace today and for this moment today to give. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. The Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen, 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 Amen. May His favor be upon you in a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you and within you he is with you he is with you in the morning in the evening and you're coming and you're going and you're weeping and rejoicing he is for you 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 amen Amen, 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 Amen. Bank. Can we give a round of applause, please? Thank y'all. Well, today we are continuing our message series called Savior, a time which we are, are diving into. We started last week diving into different atonement theories that bring us about to the meaning of the cross. So why Jesus came to die? What does that mean for us? And what does that mean with our relationship between um, ourselves and with God and ourselves with other people and God's creation. And so we're studying different atonement theories. Atonement theories. If you've been joining me on, on Wednesday nights, we just started last week. 
I encourage you, if you still want to join me, come on over and join me on Wednesday nights at 6.30. It's a, a great class where we're studying McGray de Vega's book of the same name. And we talked about, also last Sunday, what does the word atonement mean? So Latin, it comes from unity, right? We get that word unity from it as well. And I I taught you last week that there's a a breaking up the word kind of brings us into a different picture, and that is at one meant, right? At one meant. What does it mean to be at one with God and with other people, right? So that brings us around to the meaning behind the cross itself. You know, one of the funny things that I learned in the class is we're going around and talking about, you know, why we're here, why we're studying this book, why we're interested. A bunch of folks in that class said, well, I didn't know there was more than one theory behind it, right? I didn't know there was more than one way of looking at the cross. I didn't know that it was okay to believe in other things besides substitutionary atonement, right? Substitutionary atonement is the thing that we talked about last week where Christ takes our place on the cross, that the wages of sin are death, the scripture passage that we read, and it needs to be paid for. And so Jesus goes on the cross to pay the price of our sins. What we learned last week is that's not the only theory behind the cross, right? That is not the only biblical, underline that word, right? Biblical way of viewing Christ's action on the cross and the crucifixion. Now, substitutionary atonement is the most prevalent and and probably the most uh, popular one, both in modern day uh, American Christianity, at least, and earlier. But it's not the only way of looking at the cross. That as I challenge you to kind of view these atonement theories as almost looking at a, a bright diamond that the sun is shining down on. That as you turn the diamond just a little bit way, you see a different angle and you may see something different, a different color, a, a different kind of different clarity around it. That you're able to look at it a different way. And this is what we're talking about when we talk about atonement theories. Substitutionary atonement being one of the six that we'll journey through together. And today we'll talk about the ransom atonement theory. So with all that in mind, before we open up God's word, let us go to God in prayer. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, we are grateful that you are here for us. That you're ever present in our lives, whether we realize you're present or not, that you are there. And that you are interacting with us, wooing us, pushing us forward into your great love. And for that, God, we are thankful. And God, as we open up a word for us, as we will open up the words of Jesus found the gospel of Luke, may you speak something new and fresh for us. That we may not only intellectually come to understand who you are through a, a weird thing called atonement theories, but that we may experience you from the inside out. That this may bring a deeper meaning into who you are and how much you love each one of us. We ask all this in the powerful name of Jesus Christ and all God's beloved children said. Amen. So today we'll open up the Gospel of Luke, the fourth chapter, or just a few verses in there, 16 through 20. And, and I call this kind of Jesus' job description. Jesus' job description. Why is Jesus here? What does Jesus come to do? What does Jesus transform for us? We'll find in the Gospel of Luke, the fourth chapter, verses 16 through 30, 20. And you'll find these on the screens in front of you. Jesus went to Nazareth, where he had been raised. On the Sabbath, he went to the synagogue as he normally did and stood up to read. The synagogue assistant gave him the scroll from the prophet Isaiah. He unrolled the scroll, found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the prisoners, and recovery of sight to the blind to liberate the oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the synagogue assistant, and sat down. Every eye in the synagogue was fixed on him. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. You know, as we went through the storms of the last couple of days, I mean, does anybody still not have power here? Does everyone have power that's good. There was only one, and it, it's poor Sandra Simpson is still without power, if you, if you know her. And it's just a terrible week um, for her to not have power. Um, but, you know, across our street, we live in St. Matthew's neighborhood. 
um, across our street. They don't have power. Molly's church, my, my wife is a pastor in PRP. Her church doesn't have power anymore. I mean, it just went widespread, right? And it's weird how you can go street to street and different people are affected in different ways. Um, but, but it reminded me at all these times when we went without power growing up. I'm from Florida, so we went through a lot of hurricane seasons when I lived down there, and we lost power all the time. Right, power for that go weeks and it can go months at, at times and, and really can put stress on families, right? On individuals, you question your sanity after a while without power, you know. But one of the things that also questioned our sanity was the things that we would try to do, right? When the power is out, and one of those things, of course, is playing board games. Do you play board games when the power's out? Yeah, some of you, yeah, some of you not. But one of the board games that we would that we would play, and, and this can be a very contentious question. Okay, this can be something controversial, but we can still be a family and disagree on tough things, right? Would you agree? We can be a family and disagree on very important things. But one of these, one of the important things is that we would always play the game Monopoly. I know. How many people love the game of Monopoly? Anybody love it? How many of you hate the game of Monopoly? All right, come with me. There you go. How many of you love to hate the game Monopoly, right? I mean, we're all, we're all in there. I feel like Monopoly is one of those things that you either love or you hate it, right? I mean, there's some people who can't wait to play the game Monopoly. Like if we just took a break in worship and said, you know, I think everything we can learn, we can learn from the game of Monopoly and put it out there. Some of you would, be love, would love to do that, right? Just so you could beat somebody in this room at the game of Monopoly. I know who you are, right? I mean, you, you would love that. And then some of you are like, I don't have nine hours to waste of my day, right? in Monopoly. But Monopoly is something that you can either love or hate. And I, I think a, a game that can teach us a lot of things, I'll be honest, I, I'm more on the non-loving side of Monopoly, right? I'm not good at math. I am a pastor, right? I do, we do not count very well. But um, here's some, some facts about Monopoly that you may or may not know, and we're going to question some of your knowledge. This may be really good for your pub trivia later on. I don't know, but here's the first one. The first version of the game was created by a woman. Did you know that? Anybody know that? Yeah, the first version of the game was created by a woman. Her name was Lizzie Maggie, and she made the patent in 1904. Get this, 1904 for the Landlord's Game. Landlord's Game. Then, of course, along came Charles Darrow in 1933, quite a few years, and he only made a few tweaks to her game, and that's the game that he sold to the Parker Brothers in 1935. There you go. I mean, we've seen that over and over, and... Again, in history, right? I mean, here we are. All right, so the first version of the game was created by, the wo- by a woman. Here, the next one you may or may not know is the Monopoly Man was inspired by a real tycoon. Did you know that? Do you know his name? Hey, I'm going to throw his picture up on there, Chris. Here he is, right? Does he look like the Monopoly Man? A little bit, right? Right? Do you know his name? This is a theory, right? We have atomic theories. We also have theories about this. J.P. Morgan. J.P. Morgan is, is possibly right. He's a big, powerful banker, um, possibly inspired the Monopoly man of there. But we know it's based on some kind of real tycoon that ruled the day. On um, the next one, I'll go through these pretty quickly. There isn't much money in the bank. There's only about $20,000 accounted in a typical Monopoly game, right? So not that much money that's on there. There are over 300 different versions of the game Monopoly. You could probably believe that, right? Anybody have an obscure version of Monopoly? Which ones do you have? Ohio State? Ohio State? Yikes. Okay, anybody else? And Oklahoma. Uh, Oklahoma? Okay. Anybody else? Doctor Who? Doctor Who? Oh, that's kind of cool. Yeah, this, this last uh, service, we had Star Wars and Star Trek. And I said we can disagree on hard things, right, and still love each other, right? Yeah, there's over 300 different versions. I mean, is there, is there a Louisville one? I haven't seen it, but yeah, I, yeah. anyways, so it shouldn't surprise you. 300 different versions of Monopoly, some very obscure ones are out there. I, I encourage you to look them up. It, it, it probably wasted 30 minutes of my sermon prep time looking at different versions, but here we are. The, the, the last one I'll, I'll share you before, the big one, is the longest game lasted longer, more than two months. Isn't that crazy? Two months. Can you imagine sitting down at two months playing this game? Anybody have patience to do that? Patience is a virtue, I've heard, but I just do not have it, right? I mean, two months. And then the last fact I'll share with you that probably won't surprise you is you'll probably go to jail, right? Now, I'm not talking about real jail, right? But although I will say, if I'm in that game for two months, I might be in jail at the end of it, right? I mean, there's no way. But you'll probably 
go to jail at some point or another. The top three most land on spaces in the game of Monopoly are these. J the jail, Illinois Avenue, and go. Those are the top three spaces you are almost guaranteed to hit at least once. The jail, Illinois Avenue, and go. You see, sitting in jail has to be the worst part of Monopoly, don't you agree? The worst part of the game of Monopoly. I mean, you're frozen there. You're trapped in that little space. Everyone else is free to go about their business. They're flaunting all of their money. They're traveling around their board with their little weird little pieces. And they're, they're just living their life, collecting money, buying properties. And there you are, sitting in jail, rolling the dice, wishing that you could escape, right? Held up, do not collect go, do not collect $200, sit in your own shame and wait, right? That is what jail time looks like. I wonder, have you ever felt that way before? Have you ever felt that way before? Maybe not so in Monopoly, although I think that's a microcosm of real life, but trapped, held down, perhaps weighed down by something. I mean, sure, we all have, right? I think it's this universal human condition underneath us that we have felt all this before. Like, it's hard to wake up in the morning because your shoulders are so tense of what you're holding. You know, for me, and, and I'll speak to my own life, and you can insert yours into this as well, is that more often than not, it's because of the choices that I have made in my own life. That the consequences that I, I have made were perhaps where I have missed the mark, where I, I really thought I could nail it and I just didn't, or, or consequences that I have faced because of ways that I just didn't make the right decision, or even the inability, I, I, I'm a really indecisive person, the inability to make the right decision that is right in front of me. Yeah, I think we've all felt that. You see, that's what this, this next atonement theory is all about. That this is kind of the consequences, this is kind of the underlying theory, this is kind of the, the DNA behind it that we can't get in front of it. It's called the ransom atonement theory. It's like being caught up in jail monopoly where the theory deals with all this captivity and release. McGray de Vega is, uh, has a beautiful way with words, and he does this in his book, Savior of uh, the Same Name, and it says this. Let's throw this up on the screen. He says, one biblical view. Did you hear that? Let's pause right there. One biblical view, the substitutionary atonement theory is not the only biblical view, right, of this. One biblical view, I should have underlined that, of what Jesus accomplished on the cross is built on the idea that sin has held us hostage, imprisoned by a captor who is beyond our control, and that sin binds our ability to live the free and forgiven life that God intends for us. Do you feel those words? Have you felt those words in your life before? Sure. I mean, yeah, if you look at this, I think this is a microcosm of humanity here. I think this is a universal human condition. Hey, I, I felt this before. What's on the cross is the idea that sin has held us hostage. What is that? Harm our tea, ways we've missed the mark. Let's throw that back up on there for just a few more seconds, Chris. Sin has held us hostage. We've been imprisoned by a captor who's beyond our control. Ever felt like you can't get out of something because you've caused it? I mean, who's beyond our control, and that sin binds our abilities. To live the free and forgiven life that God intends for us. Sure, we have felt that. And I would say we don't just feel that personally on my own level, although that is more, more likely than true, right, that we have felt that. But I would say, hey, open it up. This is what our communities have felt. Hey, open it up a little bit more. This is what our, our country has felt. Hey, open up a little bit more. This is what our world has felt, right? Sin has held us hostage imprisoned by a captor who's beyond our control and binds our abilities to live life, the good life, a good, free, and forgiven life that God intends for us. You want to talk about systemic issues? Here, here it is. Imprisoned us. Binds our abilities. Yeah, we felt that. 
That sin has, we've become prisoners of it. That we need to be set free of it. That we all struggle with something in this life. We can name that. We all have things that kind of weigh us down. That make our, our bodies just tighter and tighter. We all kind of make those mistakes along the way. That make us feel like we just can't get out on our own. And here's where Jesus comes into play. That Jesus saves us by giving his life on the cross as a ransom to set us free. You see, Paul writes this all throughout our scriptures. Each one of his letters, both the ones that we know, hey, yeah, Paul probably wrote this or had someone write it for him, or ones that, hey, it sounds like Paul, so it probably could be Paul, but most likely not, but we kind of consider it the same way, right? And, and part of these, Galatians is, is one of those letters, and we see last week we read some of his letters about what it means that Jesus takes our place, the kind of substitutionary, kind of that blood language behind it, and, and here's the same Paul writing about a different different look at what the cross means for us. So in Galatians, this, this beautiful letter that, that a community is, just, is stretched, but is also divided and, and really imprisoned by their own selves, says this. In, in Galatians chapter 3, he writes this to, to the church at Galatia. Now before faith came, were we, we were imprisoned and guarded under the law until faith would be revealed. You see that, see that ransom language in here? We're imprisoned. We're guarded under the law until faith become real. Some that was created to make communities holy, right? To make them united and just became a weight that we couldn't overcome, that we messed up so many times we can't get out of it. So faith came, right? Jesus, faith came into our lives to set us free, right? from this way of living. So the Gospel of Luke continues that kind of fun. And, and I told you earlier that this Luke 4 is one of my favorite chapters of Scripture because it gives us Jesus' job description on earth. It gives us why he came, who he came for, and, and what that looks like for us. See, I, I love job descriptions. Do you? Have you ever worked in a place that didn't have a job description for you? What do you do when you don't have a job description? You guess, right? <laughs> or you don't do work, I guess. I think someone said, right? I mean, you, you, you just don't know what to do. I mean, I've worked in places that didn't have a job description. You just kind of guess. And, and that kind of the, the target just kind of moves on you, it feels like. You know, or maybe you've worked at a place and you're a manager and there's no updated job descriptions. Have you been there before? Right? And, the, and then your employees have to guess, you know, what, what am I supposed to do? I think every job should have a job description. Would you agree? I would also think every volunteer position should have a job description. Do you agree with me on that? I think so. Uh, on ways that you do that. If, if, I, I encourage you, um, especially this service, a, a few weeks ago you were given a, a car that said walk and serves on it, waves to serve on, on Sunday mornings. I encourage you, if you haven't filled one of those out, to fill one out on your way out and turn it in. That would probably be helpful too. Um, so that well, I can tell you, uh, here are different ways that you can serve the body of Christ here at Watkins on Sunday mornings. Everything from an usher, a greeter, uh, somebody who helps kind of reset the room after we make a mess of it together, right? I mean, this is kind of ways that we can serve, and you'll actually get a job description of what that job entails once you sign up, right? Anyways, I, I think every position should have a job description. I think every person should have a job description, a meaning, a purpose. A goal, I, I encourage you to write your own job description after the service. I think you'll learn something about yourself and about God in there. But Jesus gives us his job description as a part of this passage, right? He says, hey, this is what I've come to accomplish. Here's how you, you kind of enter into it with me. So Luke chapter 4, verses 18 through 19, I, I wonder if we could read this together. Let's read this together. I, this is Jesus' job description found in the book of Isaiah first. Let's read this. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the prisoners, and recovery of sight to the blind, to liberate the oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Here it is. What has Jesus come to do? Preach good news to the poor. What has Jesus come to do? Proclaim release to prisoners. 
What does Jesus come to do? Recovery of sight to the blind, liberate the oppressed, proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. This is why Jesus came here. And in the ransom atonement theory directly says, hey, this is why the cross is so important. This is Jesus' why. Behind why he came to be here with us. There's this interesting part of Magre de Vega's book. And don't miss it if you're reading along with us. There's this interesting thing where he's talking about different areas of the world's favorite gospel passages. Different passages that they kind of claim to and, and they really hold near and dear themselves. And he starts out and says, you know what? The United States ha- has really a theme verse. Have, have you read this before? Has a theme verse. And this is the verse that you'll, you'll find everywhere printed on every place. I mean, as you drive through, particularly the American South, you see them on billboards, this verse. You'll also find these weird, like, zombie pictures, you know, of like, if you don't choose Jesus, you'll be a zombie. You know, I, I don't, no one has ever said yes to Jesus because of these billboards, right? I mean, that's, that's not it. It makes you chuckle or, or really be scared of the world if you look at those. But there's a verse that goes on here. There's also a, a, a verse that many athletes carry on. I'm, I'm from right outside of Gainesville, Florida. And so the, one of the most famous quarterbacks uh, in the entire history of collegiate football, right? Had him on his eye blacks. Who was that person? Do you remember? Tim Tebow, right? And what was the verse that was under his eyes? John 3.16, right? What is John 3.16, right? So God, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, right? I mean, you know that passage. McGray de Vega says, you know, that is, that is like the American, particularly the American South's favorite Bible verse of all time. This is the one you see everywhere. That probably when you were a kid, if you were raised in church, right, you were taught to memorize that verse before any others, right? Anybody? Yeah, yeah, right. He said that would not be the, the, that's not true for every portion of the world. That's not true for every portion of the world. We're kind of the United States, Americans would say, you know what, this, this is our, our verse. What does this verse have to do? Well, if you, if you accept Jesus Christ in your heart, it's kind of the way that we proclaim it, right? If you accept, then, then where do you get to go? Everlasting life, right? We insert heaven into that. Everlasting life. So there's a kind of looking towards the future to say, hey, if, if I just, you know, God sent his son so that we may have freedom and, and we can have freedom. What does that freedom look like? Well, everlasting life. And he said, you know, that's not particularly the, the most favorite verse of some parts of the world. And he uses Latin America as one of the examples. And he said, you know, Latin America, they, they know that verse, sure, but they rely heavily on another verse. And what verse is that? This one. You have your John 3.16. It's, it's very good, very important. But this is the one that particularly Latin America and liberation theology would kind of rely upon even more so than John 3.16. Good news to the poor. Release the prisoners. Recovery of sight to the blind. Liberate the oppressed. You see, that speaks the folks in Latin America. That speaks of people who have had a difficult story. That speaks to not only the future, but the here and now. You see, the ransom atonement theory speaks to the freedom in which Christ brings to the world. The ransom atonement theory speaks to the freedom in which Christ brings into the world. It's a release of sorts, not just a a communal, systemic, corporate release. That is very important, but also a personal release for us. See, what in your life has chained you down? What in your life has just weighed you down that makes you ache at night that makes it hard to take that next step what are you struggling with that needs to be set free maybe it's your chain is anger and bitterness someone just ticked you off or some situation just made you a bitter person Maybe your chain is is hopelessness, that you look around the world, you turn on the news for two seconds, and you just see, hey, there is no way this world's ever going to get any better. 
Maybe your chain is guilt. They did something just, just bad in your life. Maybe it severed a relationship that you'd really just want to have back, but you just don't know how to do it. Maybe your chain is an anxiety of your future, or maybe your chain is just the fear of death itself. See, Jesus has come to set you free. That the whole reason behind the crucifixion, the whole reason behind Jesus going on the cross, yes, the resurrection comes, but the whole reason it was Jesus comes and, and walks that, that, that innocent, pure life, the whole reason why God comes in human form to come and teach us how to live and gives his life on the cross is to give good news to people like you and me. That in Jesus' death on the cross through the crucifixion, he invites you to release those chains of bitterness, anger, resentment, right? To release those chains of hopelessness or fear of death or fear of another person different than yourselves. It, it, he does for you on that cross, but we couldn't do on our own. You see, we're, you're about to be invited, and we'll sing our, our final song. You're about to be invited to come forward and receive Holy Communion, right? Holy Communion is a means of grace that we describe in, in the United Methodist tradition. It means that no matter who you are, what you've done, or where you come from, you're invited to come forward, and you receive the simple things like a piece of bread and, and a little cup that's Welch's grape juice, right? Very simple, ordinary things that we believe Christ is somehow present in there giving us sustenance and nourishment that is a spiritual meal. And as you come forward, what I hope is that you come forward and you, you put your hands up because there's nothing you do to ever earn or deserve this and, and more than anybody else in, in the entire world. You come forward with your hands up receiving as an act of grace. What I encourage you to do is when you come forward and you do that, for you, maybe it may be kneeling at the altar. You can do that. For you, it may be returning your seat and just taking a, a centering time. But as you come forward, I, I want you to lay down. I think Christ invites us every time we take that step with him to invite our, an invitation to lay down those chains of bitterness, anger, resentment, worry, anxiety, fear. And as even we just breathe out the air, we receive into us the bread and the cup. We get rid of things that are bad for us and we ingest and breathe in things that are life-giving. So that's my invitation for you. What things you need to lay down this morning. As a part of Holy Communion, we're not going to go through the whole liturgy together this morning. But what I want us to do is do the confession and pardon together. Ways that we are able to come to Christ's table because of what Christ has done for us. And part of that is an invitational posture to let go of the things we just need to let go of. So Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Let us pray together these words. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love towards you. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. There's this beautiful time when Jesus is, is with his disciples in the upper room. And he's sharing a, a meal with them. And after the supper, he, he took something like bread. 
He gave thanks to his father above. He broke the bread. He gave disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when that same supper was over, he took the cup and he gave thanks to his father above. He gave disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, we ask that you pour out your Holy Spirit and all of us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. We, as the United Methodist Church, practice what we call an open table. Or it doesn't matter who you are, if you're a member of Watkins or not, we, we, don't, we don't care. Because Jesus invites you to this table, not us. And Jesus accepts all as a table, no asterisks or exceptions as a part of that. That come and taste and see that the Lord is good. After we get the, the communion elements ready, you'll be invited to come forward. We're not going to be ushered row by row, but come as you are able and as you would like. If you need to be served in your pew, you're more than welcome to do that as well. Come taste and see that the Lord is good. lost but he brought me in oh his love for me oh his love for me who the sun sets free oh is free and he how much child of God yes I am Free at last, he has ransomed me, his grace runs deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, he died for me, who the sun sets free, oh, it's free indeed. I'm a child of God, yes I am, in my Father's house, there's a place for me, I'm a child of God, yes I am, I am chosen, not forsaken, I am who you say I am You are for me, not against me I am who you say I am I am chosen, not forsaken I am who you say I am You are for me, not against me I am who you say I am, I am who you say I am, yes I am who you say I am, in my Father's house there's a place for me, I'm a child of God, yes I am. Who the sun sets free, oh, it's free indeed. I'm a child of God, yes, I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God, yes I am. 
who the sun sets free all is free indeed I'm a child of God yes I am in my father's house there's a place for me I'm a child of God yes I am Ask that you'll stand as you're able for this morning's benediction. Now go. In the name of Jesus Christ, to be a redeemed people, to have tasted and seen that the Lord is good, and receive this blessing today. Blessed are we in the tender place between curiosity and dread. We who wonder how to be whole when dreams have disappeared and part of us with them. Where mastery, control, determination, bootstrapping, and grit are consigned to the realm of before where most of the world lives. In the fever dream that promises infinite choices, unlimited progress, best life now. Blessed are we in the after. Forced into stories we never would have written, far outside of answers to questions we even know to ask. God Show us a glimmer of possibility in this new constraint that small truths will be given back to us. We are held. We are safe. We are loved. We are loved. And we are loved. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Grace and peace, my friends. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am who you say I am. Yes, I am who you say I am. Through the sun's father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. Who the sun sets free. Oh, it's free. I'm a child of God, yes I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God, yes.